comes from the textbook A1 number 3. Uh, it's an angle side side problem and it's drawn a little bit differently than the way I would recommend drawing it. The way that I will always draw it is with the unknown side at the bottom, the base of the triangle if you will, and then I'll do angle side side and the side opposite the angle that we know is our dangling side that we have to analyze uh, compared to the height. So the height of this rectangle is determined by looking at the right triangle in yellow. So that right triangle, we can calculate the height using right triangle trig and what we get when we do that is that the sine of 37.8 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse, so that's h divided by 25, which tells us that h is equal to 25 times the sine of 37.8 degrees. And if we type that into the calculator, what do we get for that height? So 15, so definitely we have at least one triangle. So that's about 15. We see that this side right here is bigger than 15. And if that side is bigger than 15, then we know that that dangling side can in fact reach the base. Then we have to analyze its length compared to the other side that's given. And that length is that side length is shorter than this, so that means we can find two triangles. That means we have two triangles. We'll have an inner and an outer triangle, and the uh, triangles will look like this. So we can take that and just drop it straight down, 22. This will be the outer triangle, which is the one we are going to start with. And the dimensions that we know on this outer triangle then are 25, 22, 37.8. This is side C. This is angle C. This is angle B. Right there. That's our outer triangle. And then the inner triangle will look like this. We'll have that. We'll tuck it underneath and we'll have a shorter side C. So C, C, 22, angle B, 25, and that angle in there is our 37.8. That makes sense, everybody? So I think it's really helpful when you notice that you have an ASS triangle to rotate it, put it in this form that we've been using to sort of analyze the height versus the dangling side. I think that's really helpful to do it the same way every time. You certainly could leave it in the way it is up here, but then it gets a little awkward in terms of figuring out how that, that second side that you know fits. Um, so I would recommend rotating it. And then once we have that, does everyone remember why we go with the outer triangle first? Yeah, to get that acute angle. Mm -hmm, that's right. Because this, this is the only choice, is to solve for angle B. And this one usually over here on this side, usually we put little stars on these to distinguish them. Or some marker. Could put a prime, whatever. Um, and that angle B is acute on the left, so we can use a lot of signs to find it. The angle B on the right, we can't find with a lot of signs. <clears throat> so then we go for angle B, and we'll put B on top, so it would be sine of angle B divided by the side opposite. And then the ratio that we're going to use will be right there, so that will be sine of 37.8 degrees divided by 22. And so angle B will be, we multiply both sides by 25 and then take the inverse sine of both sides. Well, somebody type that into, our cal into your calculator. 
24.1. Thank you. So that will be our angle B. Is that good for everybody? Processor. And then what's the next natural thing to solve for once we get angle B? Angle C. In fact, we don't have a lot of choice. That's the only thing we can solve for. The two unknowns that we have are side C and angle C. So they're both unknown, right? We can't solve for side C until we know angle C. So we really have to solve for angle C right now. Don't have a lot of choice. We have no choice, actually. We have no choice. So angle C is 180 minus 44.1 minus 37.8. When we type all that in, what do we get? What's that? 98.1 degrees. Thank you. 98.1. Now we can go for side C. Now that we have the angle opposite side C, then we can set up our proportion with side on top. Again, I think it's helpful to put your unknown in the top left corner. And if we do a side on top, we do angle down below, so sine of 98.1. And then we can use the same ratio that we used up here, but we just, we just invert it, or reciprocate it. And that will allow us to solve for side C. So we'll type all of this into the calculator. And... What do we get when we type that in? Okay, great. 35.5. When we look at the triangle above, it's rounded to the nearest unit, so we'll round that to the nearest unit to be consistent. So was it 35.5 unrounded? So I should go to 36. So if it was 34.5, we'd do it differently. It was 34.5 or whatever. And you know what I mean. If it was 35.49, we would round it to uh, 35. Cool. Now we're going to jump over to the inner triangle. And the inner triangle, we're going to solve for B star first. And we don't even have to do any math with the inner triangle itself, we actually look to the outer triangle, we take angle B, and we subtract that from angle, from 180 degrees. And so that will give us 135.9. So there's our angle B star. And then we'll follow the same order, solve for angle C star. So angle C star will be 180 minus 135.9 minus 37.8. And when we type that in, what do we get? 6.3 degrees? What a little angle. That's a cute angle. A cute little angle. That's not obtuse. All right, and then the last side that we saw for is little c star. So little c star divided by sine of angle c star. Let's see. And we can use the same ratio that we used over there for little c. So that will be 22 divided by sine of 37.8. And, whoops, we can type that into our calculator and get our result pretty easily, because we just do one multiplication here. So C star would be 22 sine 6.3 degrees divided by sine of 37.8 degrees. And when we type that into our calculator, we get how many fives? 35.53 or 35. Did you get four? Okay, four. That makes four makes more sense. And you see, now that's, when you look at your triangle, you, def, 
you see what you did wrong? On, okay. Yeah, we definitely want to double check when we look at the triangle. Does it does it make sense? And that definitely has to be shorter than those two. So we would go back and look at our calculator and make sure that we were typing it in correctly because it's easy to lose a division symbol or a parenthesis or something. All right. Eight one. Yeah. So, sorry. I just remembered about this question. That's fine. It's in eight point one. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the last one. It has like thirty seven degrees by forty minutes. Let's take a look. So eight one, and the last one. That guy right there. a little bit. It's nice to have a, you know, a whiteboard that you can write on. A nice one of those little whiteboards you can over because you're going to be erasing probably at least at least once, if not twice, trying to set this up. Okay, so we have an island located northwest of a city. So island city. Right? So the island is north and west of the city, and the freighter in distress radios its position as north and east of the island. All right, so we've got the city, and then northwest of the city is the island, and then northeast of the island uh, is the freighter. So we just have to give ourselves enough space to get all those things in there properly. So I think if I start over here, I think it will be good. Okay, so the island is 44 miles, so that's going to be the length of the segment we draw. And it's north 33 degrees, 11 minutes west. So north and west. So we're going to do north and west. We're only 17 degrees west. So 17 degrees is kind of small. I'll draw it probably looking a little bigger than 17, just to make sure it fits. And these guys, let's call that angle in there. So we're at that angle is because the, there's going to be another messy line coming in here. So let's put the angle out there. So that's 33, 11. 33 degrees, 11 minutes. Okay. So, city is right here. There's our city. And then here is the island. And now we need a little coordinate system at this island so that we can measure coming off of this island. So there's a coordinate system at the island. And now from the island, north and east of the island is where the freighter is. Okay, so north and east of the island. And here's where you've got to be really careful. So we're going to go north and east. So we're only going 15 degrees to the east. So it's going to be something like this. But we need to know, relative to this north-south line here, we need to know which side of that we end up on. Right? That's going to really impact how we analyze the angles of our triangle. If this ends up right here, then we have to draw a line segment there. If it ends up over here, then it's going to be, it's really pivotal that we get that, the length of that segment right. And the way we calculate that is to look at this. So they give us this extra piece of information. So they say that we're northeast of the island, but we're northwest of the city. So we're on the left of that vertical dotted line there. So that's why it gets a little bit messy in there. So we're, we've got to stop like that. And then we've got to draw this line here, which I'm going to use a dashed line. Uh, maybe a dashed line is not a good idea. Um, we'll put a solid line there. OK, so when we look at that, we've got to be really careful with our angles. That 3311 is all the way over to the vertical line here. Right? And we've got that little sliver angle in there we've got to be careful with. Okay, so now the length that we have, we only have that one length. 
And that's the distance between the city and the island. So that's one, only one side of this triangle we know. And that's right here. That's the 44. OK, so we, our goal, the hardest part of the problem, is figuring out the angles that are inside the triangle. The angles that are inside the triangle. That red angle is not inside the triangle. So let's deal with that first. So this angle down here that's inside the triangle is going to be this red angle here minus that little sliver angle. And that little tiny sliver angle right there is this uh, last one, 17 degrees 33 west, uh, 17 degrees 33 minutes. Okay. So our angle in the triangle right there is going to be this red angle, 3311, minus 1733. That should be degrees, that should be minutes. So it should look like that. All right. Those minutes are less than those minutes, so we can't subtract directly, so we have to do some borrowing. So we're going to make that 32 degrees, and we're going to take one degree and turn it into 60 minutes, and 60 plus 11 is 71. So we're going to have that. All right, so now we can subtract. 71 minus 33, what's that like, 38? And then 32 minus 17 is 15. So that is an angle in the triangle. Is everybody OK with that? That is in the triangle. OK, so now we need to find another angle in the triangle. So here I'm going to focus on this. Well, it, it looks obtuse. We'll just assume it's obtuse right there. So that green angle is going to be comprised of, I'm thinking of it as two parts. Let's break it into the blue angle, which is going to go from there to there, and the red angle from there to there. Everyone understand that? So we've got to get that, that obtuse angle, which I've drawn as green, and it's going to be comprised of red plus blue. All right, now, this 3311, right there, is the same as this angle over here. Okay, that one right there. Those are opposite interiors. So that blue <coughs> angle right there, we can find by doing the, the uh, complement of that. You're going to agree with that? Although I am seeing another way we could do this too. We could also say that this is a straight angle, 180 degrees, and we could subtract off this and this, those two on the outside. We could do it that way also. So a couple of ways we could go. Before we write anything down, let's analyze up here this uh, 1733 and see if we can, if we can piece that together um, in some way. All right, so let's draw another little coordinate system up here. <laughs> and hopefully not get too messy. All right, little, bless you. Little coordinate system, that's not quite vertical. Yeah, that's gonna be really tricky. <laughs> really tricky, but we'll, we'll manage. Okay, so that last piece, 17 uh, northwest of the city, so that's right there. That angle is alternate, uh, opposite interior of this angle right here. So that angle is also 1733. Everyone okay with that? 1733, right there. So somehow we're going to have to use that angle to get up into this range up here. Oh, actually, that angle is not going to matter, will it? It's this angle over here. It's the second one that was given. This one right here, the, the right there. 15, it's the northeast of the island. So here is our freighter up here. And that one's not going to help us so much if we're trying to get into here. What really is going to matter here is the one in here. And so that was north 15 degrees, 15 minutes east of the island. So 15, 15 is actually, actually a very helpful angle. Let's put it right there. 
that angle is the 15, 15. All right, so that one's going to help us. No, we don't need that little one up there with the freighter. And actually, now it's pretty straightforward because I think the second method I suggested to get the green angle, we could do 180 minus these two angles there, those two black angles. That's probably the fastest way. Instead of finding the complement of this to get the blue one and the complement of that to get the red, of course that works, but let's not do it. Let's do it this way instead because this looks faster. So we're going to subtract off that. And we're going to subtract off, again, that one is the same as that one. So that's 3311. And when we subtract those two, what do we get for our final angle for this appearing obtuse angle? We subtract that. 131 degrees. Say it once again. 134. 131 degrees. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's the angle. You have it from there. <laughs> so once you get the angles, you know how to go from there. Yeah, pretty much. Because once we have the angle, once we have that angle, then we have an we have a, an angle side side situation. So we know that. Let me summarize, I guess, by drawing the triangle with the angles that we now know. So our tr triangle for throwing it into law of sines or law of cosines or whatever, uh, I guess law of sines at this point. This angle here is 131, 34. This side is 44. And this angle here is 15, 38. So we have a side in between two angles, angle side side. And I forget what, what does the question ask? How far is the freighter from the city? So we're looking for this long side here. So this is our unknown. Let's call it C. And do you see where to go from there? Mm -hmm. So we, if we're going to use, use law of sines, this ratio is unknown. Oh, whoops, that's not. We don't compare two sides when we're looking at a ratio. This ratio is the unknown ratio that uses side C. So the known ratio is going to have to be with this side and that angle up there. And that angle is easy to find because we take these two known angles and subtract them from 180 to get that angle. And then we can use both sides. All right, good. Excellent. That is definitely hard. So I want to do two more for me. Three, the uh, lecture on Thursday, we were talking about roots of complex numbers. I want to do two more of those just to get just some more practice. Because these are certainly tricky. So the one on the left, let's do that first. The cubed roots of that complex number. The nice thing about roots of a complex number is that the answers are all evenly spaced on a circle. So as soon as we have one answer, we can get the other ones by adding whatever our angle space is. So the first thing I suggest is write an equation that has solutions equal to whatever we're looking for. So we're looking for the cube roots of that number. So I would say, hey, let's write this equation. This equation has the solutions that are the numbers we're looking for. Right, we're, we're looking for the third roots of negative 64i. So that's our first step. Write an equation. And then we want to identify the number of solutions and how far apart they are. So a cubic will have three solutions. If it was z to the fourth, we'd have four solutions. z to the tenth, we'd have ten solutions. So that part's easy. And then how far apart are they? So if we have three solutions evenly spaced on a circle, that means that they have to be how many degrees apart? 120. So we take 360 and divide it by 3, and we get 120 degrees apart. Yeah. Good. OK. Now we need to take the right-hand side and write it in polar form, trigonometric form. Those both mean the same thing, polar and trigonometric form. So we need. To rewrite the standard A plus BI form as a trigonometric form. 
And to do that, we need two pieces of information. If we look at a picture, negative 64i, that's just down on the imaginary axis down at negative 64. Right, that's negative 64i. That's that number way down there. And having a picture of it, or at least a picture in your mind, is important because we need two things. We need theta and we need r. Those two pieces of information give us the trigonometric form of that complex number. OK, what's the r? How far away is that from the origin? 64. It's positive. Distance from origin, positive. And then cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. What's theta? Yeah, 270 degrees. Mm -hmm. Exactly, 270 degrees. Squeeze that in there. And if you want to write it in shorthand notation, which I think is really convenient, we would say 64 CIS 270 degrees. So that's the trigonometric form, also known as the polar. Now we need to find one solution. There's three of them. We need to find the first one. And the way we are going to find the first one is to do what your instinct would be with this equation. And that's to take the third root of both sides. Right? To solve that for z, your instinct would be to take the cubed root of both sides. That's how you would get to z, take the cubed root. So we're going to take the cubed root of the polar number here trigonometric form here. And that is evaluated using De Moivre's theorem. De Moivre's theorem says, take that power, which in this case is a root, take that exponent, I guess I should call it an exponent, that exponent in this case it's a root, and we're going to apply it to the coefficient, and we're going to apply it to the angle. Applying to the coefficient means take the third root of 64. Applying it to the angle means multiply the two. And what's the cubed root of 64? Four. Four times four times four is 64. So the cubed root of 64 is four. Divide 270 by three and we get 90. All right, there is our first answer. That is our first answer in polar form. Now we can find the other answers super easily. So z2 will be on a circle of the same radius, so that <coughs> means we just stick a 4 in front. z3 will be on a circle with the same radius. And what do we do to the 90? Add 120. 120 plus 90 is 210. And then we add 120 again, and we get 330. So now we have all three answers in this trigonometric form. Now we only have one step left. Convert back to A plus BI form. So Z1, come up here. It's four times. So we need to convert this back to A plus BI. CIS 90 degrees. So the cosine of 90 is 0. So the A plus BI form of that number, that's going to be a unit circle number. So it's going to be 0 plus 1i. Sine of 90 is 1, so that's the coefficient of i. Cosine of 90 is 0, which is this number out in front, the A, if you will. All right, Z2, and that we can, of course, simplify. That's 4i. Z2 is going to be 4 times the unit circle complex number come here. Cosine of 210 and sine of 210, that's in quadrant 3, 12 sector circle. So it's going to be minus root 3 over 2 minus 1 half i. And that will simplify to minus 2 root 3 minus 2 i. Z3, 
4. And then the unit circle complex number is right there. 330, also 12 sector circle. Root 3 over 2 and minus 1 half. So that will be positive root 3 over 2 minus 1 half i. And that will simplify to 2 root 3 minus 2i. And those are our final answers. Now, if you came up with an angle that was not on the unit circle, not a multiple of 30 or 45 degrees, then you have to use your calculator. Now, if that angle were 25 degrees up here, Instead of 90, we'd have to type in cosine 25 degrees and round it to whatever, two decimal places, four decimal places, whatever you're asked to. And then add 90 to that, and 90 to that, type it into the calculator, you get an approximation. But if you have an angle that's a multiple of 30 or 45, you can write down the exact, the exact A plus BI form. Okay, so those three numbers when raised to the third power, we'll give you minus 64i. If you FOIL this out three times, you'll get minus 64i. Everything else will cancel out. All three of those numbers. And if we had to draw a picture of these solutions, if we were drawing a picture of these solutions, we would go to the complex plane, and these solutions are on a 12 sector circle, so we could, let's see, 12 sector circle, so if we need our 12 sector circle to, maybe I won't put those, well, I guess I can put it behind it. Um, so that 12 sector circle is going to give us our location, and those three numbers, what was the first one, 4i? So 4i, that's up on top. I need this to be a little bit smaller if it's going to be a, if I need to get up to 4. It's hard to grab. All right, so 4i is up here somewhere, about right there. And then the other two solutions are coming right off this 12 sector circle there and there. And we have to go out four units from the origin. So those are the other two solutions. So they're evenly spaced on the circle of radius. <coughs> so that's always going to be the case. Evenly spaced on a circle of a common radius. <coughs> so once you get one, you get the others. So that's the way I would recommend doing it. The book has that crazy formula. If you want to use that formula, you're more than welcome to. I think this is much more intuitive. And I would count the answers Z1, Z2, Z3. The book counts them Z0, Z1, Z2, which you know, I think it's a little, gets a little confusing, but your choice. Two different ways to do it. All right, let's do one more of these. So square roots of that number. You guys go ahead and try that one. The square roots of that complex number.
part is probably step three, writing that in, com in uh, trigonometric form. What quadrant is that complex number in? Four. Quadrant four, and should you be thinking a multiple of an eight sector circle or a 12 sector circle? Eight sector circle. So you're going to be scaling off of an eight sector circle. So figure out what your angle is. And you should know your angle right off the bat. You're thinking it's probably 7 pi over 4, 315 degrees. Right. See so if you can get your, your scaling factor right. What is the R value for that number? What would you multiply the unit circle value in quadrant 4 by to get that? 4, right? If you multiply this by 4, 2 goes into 4 twice and you get 2 root 2. So 4 is the scaling factor. So our number is sitting down here 4 units away. So it's going to be 4 times root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2i. And that's going to give us the number 2 root 2 minus 2 root 2i. Yep, so it's 4 units away. So how do you write that in trigonometric form then? 4 CIS yeah, 315. Good. 4 CIS 315. So that's the right side of the equation. And that brings us to step four, where we say that Z1, our first solution, will be 4 CIS 315 degrees to the 1 half power. And that half comes over to the 4 as a square root of 4, giving 2. And what do we do to the 315? We divide it by 2. And what does that give us? 1, 6, no, not quite 160, 157.5 degrees. So there's your first solution. And we only have one other solution. The only other solution is Z2. Same radius, 2. And then we have to add 180 to that. So we put a 180 up there, add those two together. And we get 337.5 degrees. So those are our two solutions. Two solutions, 180 degrees apart. Clearly, that angle, neither of those angles is a multiple of 30 or 45, so we have to type it into the calculator. So this is the last step, Z1, when we convert back, what do we get when we type in 2 cosine of 157.5? 2 times cosine of 157.5 degrees. Let's go to just two decimal places. Negative 1.85, thank you. And then we type in 2 sine of 157.5. Two sine of 157.5 is point seven seven. Point seven seven. All right. And well, now I can guess the other one pretty easily. So it should be minus point seven seven. So this one. Oh, actually, maybe I'm wrong. Hold on. I am wrong. That should be positive. So. The, this is in quadrant two. We're going left and then up in quadrant two. To get to our quadrant four solution, we have to go right and down. So we're going to go right 0.77 and then down. Uh, 
And of course, double check me on that. I'm just using some <coughs> symmetry in my head to think about that. Type, so to type that into your calculator, you would be typing 2 cosine 337.5, and I believe you should get 0.77. And then to sine of thirty of three thirty seven point five, you should get minus one point eight five. Yeah, one point eight five for the first. Oh, I have it backwards. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, what a thing I should have drawn a picture. A picture is easier to see it. You're right. Yep. Thank you. All right. So if we think about this. If we are in quadrant two, let's just suppose that this is negative three, one. Yeah, let's just suppose this is negative three plus i. If we want to go 180 degrees apart away, we have to go over positive three and down negative one. So it should be three minus i there. Yeah, yeah. So the magnitude should have been the same. I was thinking of when you're trying to find something that's 90 degrees away, that's when you switch the coordinates, if it's 90 degrees. So if we wanted to go 90 degrees, then that would be, that would be different. So what did it ask for? Yeah? How do we get the 4 and the thing for The uh, 4 is the scaling factor. So that for our question is how do we write this number over here, the right-hand side of the equation, as in trigonometric form. And so when we look at it, we see, OK, it's positive than negative. So we're in quadrant four. And then we say, OK, we see a root two. So we're hoping it's a scalar multiple of an eight sector unit circle value. So we're guessing, we're hoping that it's a multiple of this complex number in quadrant four in the eight sector circle. And we ask ourselves, what number multiplied by, by this gives us that? How do we get from there to there? And the answer is we multiply by 4. So that's the, the scaling factor that we use on the unit circle. We multiply by 4. All right. All right, let's get to the new stuff. The new stuff. How many of you have never worked with vectors before? Oh, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> so if you don't know what they are, that means you probably haven't used them before. So when you get into, if you're doing a science major, you'll do vectors in other courses. If you're not doing a science major, maybe you won't. Vectors are used a lot in uh, physics courses and in some, certainly other math courses, if you take more math courses. And the, there's a basic idea that you have to understand with vectors that we need to talk about before we even start drawing them or thinking about them. So there are two types of quantities that we tend to analyze. And those two types of quantities are called scalars and vectors. And scalars are numbers. Those are what you've been dealing with your whole life. Scalars are just numbers. And vectors, and you need one number to describe a scalar. So a quantity that's a scalar quantity, something like temperature, is an example of a scalar quantity. Where somebody says it's 75, point, uh, 75 degrees, you know exactly what that means. You don't have to say, oh, in which direction? Right? 75 degrees means it's 75 degrees. It takes one number to describe that quantity of temperature. <clears throat> height is another thing. When we talk about height, if someone says they're 5'11", you know what it means. You don't have to ask, oh, what direction are they growing? What direction are they 5'11"? Right? One number suffices. Weight, well, body weight is another one that is a single number. We don't need a direction attached to it. So a vector quantity is a quantity that needs two numbers to describe it. And those two numbers are referred to as the magnitude and the direction. And some classic examples of that are velocity. And we have a comparison between velocity and speed. Speed means how fast you're going. Velocity in math and science means how fast are you going and in what direction are you going. So velocity is a vector quantity. If you say you're going 60 miles an hour, you need to include a direction. 60 miles 
an hour east, 60 miles an hour northeast, 60 miles an hour whatever, you know, some direction. Uh, force is another example of a velocity, or excuse me, of a vector quantity. Acceleration is another example. So those are the ones you use a lot in math and science, the velocity, acceleration, and force. Those are the three primary ones. So when we talk about force, there has to be a direction to the force. A force is a push or a pull on an object. And you could push an object in the direction of motion. Or if you think about dragging a wagon or dragging you know, some sort of object that's on the ground, you might be applying a force that's at an angle to the object. So it's really important to know what the, ang what the direction of the force is. You're going to get your maximum bang for your buck if you're going to pull exactly in the direction of motion, if you have some sort of angle, you're going, to, you're going to have less output for the application of that force if you have some sort of angle that's not exactly uh, zero degrees. Um, so a vector quantity has two numbers that describe it, magnitude and direction. And the way we represent that in a coordinate system or in general is with a directed line segment. So a, a, a vector is a directed line segment. And here's what we're going to do. So typically when we think about a directed line segment, we're thinking about a, in a, some initial point, some terminal point. Some folks will call it the, um, uh, the, the tail of the vector and the tip of the vector. The tip of the vector is where the arrow is. It indicates the direction. The tail of the vector is the starting point or the initial point. <coughs> OK, so this. First one says, sketch the pair of vectors and determine whether they are equivalent. So first, before we even draw anything, let's talk about that word for a minute. Vectors are equivalent if they have the same direction and they have the same length. Then they are the same vector. They're equivalent. So what that means is that you can draw a vector in any place you want and it will be the same as any other place you want as long as you have the same direction and the same magnitude. Those are the same vector. All three of those are the same vector. So if they have the same direction, the same magnitude, they're the same. Now, there is one position for a vector called the standard position that is, tends to be really useful. And that is when you position it so that the tail of the vector, the initial point of the vector, is at the origin. And that's called the standard position for a vector. If, you're, if it's emanating from the origin, that'll be called the standard position. OK, so let's go ahead and do a couple of these. So up here, I've done <coughs> GC and JD. So what we're doing, we take point G from over here on the list. We take point C from over <coughs> here on the list. So what did I say? C and G. And what we're going to do is subtract the initial point from the terminal point. So if we're going to, this notation here says start at G and go to C. So that means we have to do C minus G, terminal minus initial. And this will create a, the vector. And this is called the component, I wrote it right there, component form of the vector. So this vector, 2 comma 1. Let's draw it in this coordinate system here. So first, let's go ahead and draw the points. So negative 2, comma 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is right there. So that is point, that negative 2, 5 is C. G is negative 4, 4. Negative 4, 4 is right there. So that's G. And we're trying to draw, we're trying to talk about the vector from G to C. So that's there. So that is vector GC. <coughs> That's one representation of the vector GC. There are infinite number, there are infinite representations. These are all vector GC. All of those are vector GC. They're all equivalent. That one is the one in standard position. The components of this vector give you <coughs> directions on how to get to the tip of the vector from the tail of the, of the vector. So that says the components are 2, 1. That means go 2 in the x direction and 1 in the y direction to get to the tip of the vector. Important observation, 
when you are in standard position, the components of the vector match the coordinates of the tip. When you're in standard position, the coordinates of the tip of the vector and the components, 2, 1, match. Up here, this terminal point, right, that terminal point is C, which is negative 2, 5. Right? This point right there is negative 2, 5. Not the same as the components of the vector. The vector is 2, 1 with angle brackets. We put angle brackets to indicate that it's a vector and not an ordered pair. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So JD, that means the vector from J to D. We look at J, J is 3, 1. So that is, I'm going to have to use, let's move some of this stuff around. Um, I don't even know how to move that. Oh, let's just rotate it out of the way. <laughs> All right, so 3, 1 is right here. There's 3, 1. So 3, 1 is J. Let's label it J. And then we're going to D, and D is negative 1, negative 1. So D is down here at that point right there. And if we want to do JD, we have to do terminal minus initial. So terminal minus initial. So we're going from J to D. We're drawing it that direction. So this says from J to D, from J to D, terminal point is D. We can do D minus J. D minus J. And that will give us the component form of the vector. Terminal minus initial. So if we do terminal minus initial, we get negative 4, negative 2. So that vector right there, that's negative 4, negative 2. Negative 4 means go left 4 from the initial point and then go down 2 and you'll get to the tip of the vector. And again, that representation is not unique. You can put that vector anywhere. That is also the same vector, JD. Doesn't matter where it is, it's still called vector JD. And if you did position it right at the origin, then it would be in standard position, and in standard position, the coordinates, the coordinates of the terminal point, the coordinates would be negative 4 and negative 2. Those match the components of the vector, if it's in standard position. All right, so let's do these two. So FO, you can loosely think of, your, of doing point O minus point F. That's not correct to say mathematically, but you know, that's kind of what you're thinking in your head. Point O, terminal point minus initial point. So point O minus point F. Go to point O, that's the origin. We're subtracting off point F. Point F is 2 comma 1. And so the vector, the component form of the vector we're looking at, would be 0 minus 2, so that's negative 2, and then 0 minus 1, negative 1. That's the component form of the vector. This one, g minus c. So we figure out what g is, that's negative 4, 4. We're subtracting off c, negative 2, 5. That's going to give us negative 2, excuse me, negative 2 comma negative 1. So that's how we find the component form of a vector. Any questions on that part? Okay. So, the next thing we need to know how to do is add and subtract vectors. And there are two ways. You can do it geometrically, you can do it algebraically. First we're going to go through the geometric combining of vectors.
And so what we do if we want to add or subtract vectors is this. We'll align them so that their initial points coincide. So we'll take two vectors and we'll line them up so that their initial points are the same. The tails coincide. Whenever you have two vectors set up like that with, your, with the coinciding tails, there is this thing that I call the implied parallelogram. <clears throat> so anytime we have two vectors aligned, you can draw that parallelogram. And all the way through calculus, there are times where you need that parallelogram. That parallelogram is going to have all sorts of properties <clears throat> throughout math. So that implied parallelogram will have the diagonal, the main diagonal, that will be the sum of the two vectors. That will be vector v plus w. <clears throat> the other diagonal of the parallelogram Notice that the vector tip is up here and the vector tail is down there. So this is vector v, this is vector w. v minus w will be that vector right there. <coughs> now, the question might be, well, why is that v minus w? Why doesn't go the other way? And here's, what we're gonna, here's how we're going to think about it. So first off, in order for us to understand subtraction, we need to know how to scale a vector. So scaling means taking your vector and multiplying it by a constant. You're going to shrink it or stretch it, compress or, or stretch. <clears throat> if you take vector v and you multiply it by minus 1, it just swip, switches the direction, 180 degrees. It doesn't change the length, though. It stays the same length. It's just pointing the other direction. If you take vector v and you multiply it by 2, it points in the same direction, but it's just twice as long. All right. So that allows us to understand subtraction then. Because with v minus w, we can think of this as v plus the vector minus w. And we now know what minus w means. Minus w means just flip w. So let's do that. If we take, oh, that's one object. Let's not take that. So if we, if we build vector v, there's v, there's w. So there's w. Well, minus w is going to look exactly like that, except it's going to be rotated and 180 degrees, so it should look something like that. And I claim that that's the same exact length. So there's minus w. And we just learned how to add two vectors. To add those two vectors together, we say, oh, there's an implied parallelogram. So let's draw that implied parallelogram. And the vector sum, which is also known as the resultant vector, that's going to be v plus minus w, shorthand v minus w. <coughs> right there. All right, that's how we just defined addition. You line up your vector's tails, draw the diagonal. So I lined up the vector's tails, v and minus w, I drew the diagonal. And we know that this vector is not unique. This representation is not unique. It also, if I drew it perfectly, would fit right there. I'll make it perfect. Right there. So that's also v minus w right there, which is the other diagonal of the parallelogram. <clears throat> the thing you want to remember is that it's always pointing to the vector you're starting with. V minus W is going to point to V. So that is how we would geometrically add and subtract <coughs> two vectors. Any questions before we take a break? After the break, we'll add these in vectors and subtract these vectors algebraically. You'll find it pretty simple, I think. So if there's no questions, let's take 10. Take a 10. And then we'll... All right, so let's do, before we get to the algebraic method of combining vectors, let's do a couple of quick applications. So this is a force application. We've got some object, and two forces are dragging on it. One at 60 newtons, one at 50 newtons. 
And again, a force is a push or a pull on an object. And so the question says, find the magnitude and the resultant and the angle that it makes with the larger force. So this is a pretty simple setup because it's going to form a rectangle. So the implied parallelogram is simply a rectangle. And the resultant vector, <coughs> in other words, the sum of those two vectors, is right there. All right. And so then they're also asking us to find this angle right there. We'll call it alpha. OK. So here, it's simple enough to find the magnitude of the resultant vector. I'll call it capital R. And the magnitude of R, we're going to represent with absolute value bars, just like we did of a complex number. That will represent magnitude or length. And in this case, it's pretty simple again because it's a right triangle. So we can use right triangle trick. So we would do this. <coughs> and can somebody type that into your calculator and round it to the nearest? Let's just round it to the nearest unit since the other forces are to the nearest unit. 78. And so units of force in the metric system are newtons. So the effect on that object is that it's undergoing a, a, a force of 78 newtons in that direction. Now we have to figure out what angle alpha is. They said the angle that it makes with the larger force. We can think of this right triangle down here as the, as the triangle that we want to analyze. Right there. So we can find alpha really easily in this situation by using the tangent function. You could also use sine or cosine, but we rounded to get to that number, so let's use tangent. Tangent seems to be the function that most people use when they're finding angles for forces. So tangent of alpha is 50 over 60. And in this particular case, alpha is an acute angle, so it's totally fine to write the following. Because we know that inverse tangent is going to find an angle on the right, an inverse tangent of a positive number will find an angle in quadrant one, i.e. an acute angle. So we can write that. Now if we knew that that angle was obtuse, we wouldn't write this. We would write alpha prime equals that. And we'd have to use a reference angle if the angle was not acute. So type that into your calculator and let's round that to the nearest degree. What do we get? 40 degrees, so that's our angle with the larger force. All right. So again, we call that the resultant vector. When you add two vectors together, it results in that vector. Right, let's do another one. So here the angle is not a right angle, so it's going to be a little bit more work. The concept is the same, though. So let's just make sure we understand what they're asking. We've got these two forces acting on this object, 64 degree. Find the magnitude of the resultant and the angle that it makes with the smaller force. So let's just draw our, our parallelogram. And let's draw the resultant vector, which will go right across the, right across there. And then the angle that they're asking for is with the smaller force. So they're looking for that angle. We'll call it alpha. All right. So given the fact that we don't have a, a, a rectangle, it's going to be a little more complicated. And I'm going to put the 325 over here. We can use either this top triangle or the bottom triangle. It doesn't matter. I'll focus on the top triangle. Now we notice that that result, or excuse me, we notice that that angle is chopped up. It's chopped up by that resultant vector. So that angle is not part of the triangle that I'm looking at, the yellow triangle. Right? That angle is chopped up, and, and it's not chopped evenly. <coughs> so that 64 is not going to be helpful directly. Somehow we have to figure out one of the angles in the triangle. And do you see how the 64 will generate an angle in the triangle, namely this angle up there? So 
So what is the, the, the sum of two adjacent angles in a parallelogram always add to? 180, exactly. So this angle up here is 180 minus 64. All right, so that's 116 degrees right there. So just like a rectangle, two adjacent angles add to 180. Parallelogram, same thing. Two adjacent angles add to 180. So that angle right here plus that angle right there add to 180. Same for these two. Those would add to 180. These add to 180. So adjacent, side, adjacent angles in a parallelogram add to 180. <coughs> now we have a side angle side. What do we use for side angle side? Cosines. Law of cosines. Exactly. Law of cosines. So let's call this um, let's call this distance here. Let's just call it C. We could call it R for resultant vector, but we've been using R a lot for radius, so I, let's not do that. Let's just call it C. So we use the law of cosines. C squared is going to be 255 squared plus 325 squared minus 2 times 255. Yes, let me start typing this one in times cosine of the angle 116 degrees. <clears throat> so type all that in and take the square root and let's find C. Should be in, looks like it's probably in the neighborhood of 400. Type all that in and then take the square root. And those units would be newtons. Same. Somebody else get that 493? Yeah. Confirmation? Okay. Just make sure. And now we have to find angle alpha. Now that we have side C, we can use law of sines to find angle alpha. So we can put angle alpha in the numerator. So let's do sine of alpha. The side opposite alpha is 3 and a quarter. And then the sine of 116. And ideally, we would take this out a couple decimal places to mitigate propagated error. I'll just write it as 493. But in your calculator, ideally, you're going to use a couple decimal places just to try to mitigate some error. And then alpha will be the inverse sine. And I can use inverse sine. Is it clear that alpha is acute? Right, alpha is acute, so we can use inverse sine. A triangle can't have more than one obtuse angle. So type this guy in, inverse sine of 325 sine 116 degrees divided by 493. And what do we get? Let's round that to the nearest degree since the other angles are the nearest degree. 36 degrees, thank you. 36 degrees. Okay, I think that was it. Find the magnitude of the resultant, that's the 493 newtons. The resultant, uh, find the magnitude of the resultant and the angle that it makes with the smaller force. So we have it. Law of cosines. All right. Let's do one more of these. Okay. So the magnitudes of u and v and the angle are given. So right here we have the magnitude of u, and again the absolute value bars mean that. That means the magnitude or the length of the vector, and we have our angle. So that's what we're given. So it says find the sum of u plus v, so that's why I've positioned them with their, their tails together. So you have the tails coincide, and if you have the tails coincide, you draw your implied, bless you, your implied parallelogram. <laughs> And the resultant vector is the main diagonal, right across. 
Okay. All right, so it asks us the magnitude to the nearest tenth. So follow, follow the directions. And give the direction by specifying to the nearest degree the angle that the vector makes with u, and that's the 54 uh, length vector. So I've, that's this unknown here. I put two question marks right there. So that's the angle, and that's the magnitude that we're trying to find. So looking at that parallelogram, all I did was draw the parallelogram, and I labeled opposite sides of the parallelogram. And now we can focus on one of the triangles. I'll pick the left triangle here. And do you notice how I got the 30? Is that obvious? Because we're given that big obtuse angle of 150, but that angle is split by the resultant vector, just like in the previous one. And again, it's not split evenly. That 150 is right there. It's being chopped up by that resultant vector. But we know that adjacent sides and excuse me, adjacent angles in a parallelogram add to 180 degrees. So if that's 150, this angle that's in the triangle properly is 30 degrees. It's got to add to 180. Okay. And again, we have SAS. So we're going to have to use law of cosines. And our resultant, that question mark, squared is going to equal 54 squared, law of cosines, plus 43 squared, that's the Pythagorean part of it, <coughs> minus 2 times 54 times 43 times cosine of 150 degrees. So we have to type all that into our calculator and take the square root to get the value of single question. What do we get? We type all that in, take the square root. Oh, yeah, cosine 30. Thank you. Sorry. Cosine 30. Oh, good. You didn't fall for it. <laughs> cosine of the angle opposite the side we're trying to find. Yeah. Yep, definitely. All right, what did we get for that? Uh, yeah, it said to the nearest 10. 27.3. Thank you. So 27.3. And I don't think they gave us any units up there at all. They just said the magnitude was 54 and 43. So we don't need to put units if there's no units to put. So that's the magnitude of that vector. <coughs> and then now we have to find the double question mark. We have to find that angle. So that angle right in here, so we would use law of sines to calculate that angle. That angle will be, let's see, we'll do sine of, let's create a label, double question mark. Sine of double question mark over 43 will equal the known, the known ratio that we now have, we have the 54. And we have, excuse me, that's 54. We don't know the angle opposite 54. We have the 30 degrees, and we have the side opposite that we just found above. So that's going to be sine of 30 divided by 27.3. And again, to mitigate error, it's best if you want a couple more decimal places on that just to be safe. <coughs> so our double question mark will be the inverse sine of 43 multiplied, sine of 30, we know that's 1 half, so we can plug that in right away. 27.3. And this they said to round to the nearest degree. So what do we get when we type that in? 52, 52 degrees? And is that com confirmed? 52? So, and is that okay? Do we... Are we concerned at all that that angle might not be uh, acute? Because inverse sine is only going to find an acute angle. So we have to have some, some assurance when we look at the picture. OK, pretty clear that's, that, that's not going to be obtuse, right? 
Right. This angle here is 150, and we're chopping it up. It's possible that it's chopped up so that one side might be obtuse, but when we look at that, uh, it's pretty obvious that it's not going to be obtuse. <coughs> we just have to be a little careful. All right. So let's do a word problem, one of these crazy navigation type problems. These ones actually are, I, I, they're not too bad in this section. All right, so here we have a ship, and we're, we can do this the same way that we did it before. The difference here is that we're now sort of thinking about the, we're thinking about the sides of this triangle as vectors. So there's multiple ways we can approach this. And whether we want to use, truly use a vector approach is you know, kind of is up to us. Let's just take a look at this. So ship sails northeast, and the angle is 80 degrees. So this angle right here is 80. For 120 miles. And then from there, it's going to sail southwest and south 20 degrees west. All right, so that's south and then 20 degrees to the west. So that tells us that, that the, that's where the angle 20 is. Goes for 200. How far is the ship then from the starting point? OK, so we're going to sail 200, end up down here. And our goal is to figure out this side. I'll just call it C. That's the side we're trying to find. Okay, so a couple of things here that we could do. Um, the second way to add vectors geometrically, the first way was align the tails and the diagonal of the parallelogram is the resultant or the sum of the two. So that's the first way. <coughs> you can also align <coughs> two vectors <coughs> so that the tip of one is lined up with the tail of the other. And if you do that, the resultant is the completion of the triangle. So do you see that if we took this vector right here, we could move it over there. So then it would be lined up in the traditional Cohen having the terminal point, the uh, initial points coinciding. And then if we drew the parallelogram, right there, right? the resultant vector is this right here. <clears throat> so if we think of it in vector terms, the way we find the resultant vector, you have two choices now. The first choice was to align the tails and then draw the, uh, the diagonal vector. Or if you take two vectors and you want to add them, you can align the tip of one with the tail of the other, and the resultant vector will point from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the second vector. That's also another way you can do it. Okay. Um, let's just, we'll, we'll probably, the simplest thing right now is to just treat it like we've been treating it like it's a triangle of sides, as opposed to trying to get components for this vector. We'll do components of vectors in another application. So we don't have to include this other stuff. It's just an observation at this point. So let's try to get a side angle side scenario here so that we can solve this with our traditional law of cosines. I think that's the most straightforward way to do it. We don't need to make it more complicated. So that little green angle is 10, which makes this little green angle over here 10. So that makes the triangle have an angle right there of how much? 60. Right there, 60 degrees. <clears throat> so now we have a side angle side set up. Boom. Let's go for it. We know that C squared is going to be 120 squared plus 200 squared minus 2 times 120 times 200 times the cosine of the angle opposite C, which is 60. <coughs> Type that into your calculator, take the square root, round it to the nearest uh, mile. What do we get? Type in all that. 174. 
So 174 miles, nautical miles. says from the starting point and in what direction? Okay, so in what direction? To figure out the direction, we really are going to need this angle in the triangle right here. Right, that angle is going to indicate direction. Direction, the way that we're given this, we have to go uh, north or south and then east or west from north or south. So if we know that angle right there, that will then give us this angle with the two arcs. And that's the angle that we need. Because we're going to go southeast. And we need to know how far east of south we're going. So that double arc angle we need to know. And to find that angle, we're going to have to use that up there. Um, I believe that's probably, the, is there another way that's... Uh, with this angle down here, I think that's probably the easiest way to go is to find that angle there if we call that alpha. <clears throat> so let's find alpha. So we'll do sine of alpha. Side opposite alpha looks to be 200. And then we have sine of 60 divided by the 174. So that allows us to find alpha as the inverse sine, assuming that we're pretty darn sure that it's um, not an obtuse angle. Pretty darn sure. And that's going to be 200 times sine of 60. Oh, we could have, we know that, sine of 60. And when we type that in, what do we get to the nearest degree? 85 degrees. Thank you. That. Okay, so now the other angle over here, let's just call this beta, right there, the double arc. So beta is going to be 180 minus 80 <coughs> minus 85. <coughs> so that's going to be 15 degrees. So that tells us that the, the direction, so that implies that the direction is southeast. So south. 15 degrees east. South and 15 degrees to the east. All right, any questions on that one? Got our law of cosines dialed, I think. Let's take a look at. Oh, am I going to give you another one? Wow. Camera in the applications today. Oh, I thought that was going to be our last one. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we have plenty of time. These. I'm confused. Oh, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah. Most books are going to combine the algebraic approach and the geometric approach in one section. I forgot this book splits it up. I keep thinking in my head that we're going to start doing the algebraic combining of vectors, but they, the way this book does it, it splits it. And so we don't do that until 8-6. Yeah, splits it. OK, so let's do another application. All right, you guys try this one. Let's see if you can piece it all together. up here actually that's super important because um, I don't have it up there whoops wrong way right ah. all right so you guys work on that one more
that's how you get the 10. So it tells us that we're flying at 280, which is all the way to there, so that backs off 10 to the horizontal. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Those are opposite interiors, so that's 32. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so <clears throat> is everybody pretty clear on the angles? Any question on the angles? The problem gives us the direction as 280 degrees. And when we have that type of navigation, that's from the North Pole going clockwise. So that's how we get that little angle above the horizontal to be 10 degrees. 280 minus 10 gives us 270. And then this angle is given to be 32, so alternating interiors, that's 32, which gives us the 58 as the complement of that. And then that angle in the triangle, it would be 58 plus 10, which is 68. So that's the side angle side you should end up with after you piece together all your angles. And the question said, how far is the airplane then from the starting point and in what direction? So the starting point is down here. So we're going to want to know the direction from the starting point eventually. So the direction from the starting point, if we're starting at the north and rotating clockwise, eventually we're going to want to get to that angle. Right, that's going to be the angle that's the direction. OK, so side angle side, law of cosines. That's angle C, uh, side C. Side whatever you want to call it. Side C. So that will be c squared equals 170 squared plus 210 squared minus 2 times 170 times 210 times the cosine of 68. Now when do you guys get to the nearest kilometer for c when you add that up, take the square root? 315? 215. 215. Thank you. 215 kilometers. So that is the distance the boat is it both? I mean, airplane. <coughs> airplane is from the starting point. OK, now the direction. If we look at this thing over here, the angle in the triangle that we need is this lower angle down here. So let's call that alpha. That's the, tri that's the angle we need. If we know alpha, then we can figure out with a little geometry what the direction that the plane is going in. Let's call it theta. We can find theta from alpha. <coughs> OK, law of, coast, uh, law of sines now. So law of sines, alpha, that's acute, so this should work fine. <coughs> so sine of alpha over 170 will equal sine of 68 over 215. So this tells us that alpha is the inverse sine of 170 sine of 68 all divided by 215. And what do we get for that angle, alpha to the nearest degree? 47, 47 degrees, thank you. <clears throat> all right, so 
So alpha is 47. So when we look at that right here, what we really need is this little angle there. If we knew that angle, then the direction of the plane would be 360 minus that little angle. And that little green angle right there is going to be angle alpha minus 32. So that green angle I'm going to call beta. And beta will be uh, 68. No, what was it? What did we just find? 47 minus 32. So that angle is 15 degrees. That tells us that the direction of the plane from the starting point, there's theta. Theta will be equal to 360 minus 15, which is 345 degrees. So that's <coughs> using the aerial navigation process where we're going clockwise from the North Pole. Yeah? Sure. That's not 10 pixels. Yeah, that's not 10. So that angle, that angle right there is the 15. So when we look at our triangle, we get this angle alpha. Angle alpha is this whole angle across. Angle alpha is that whole thing right there. So when we do our law of sines and get alpha to be 47, that's this whole angle right there. So if we want just this little sliver, we have to do 47 minus the 32 to get that one. Yeah, I understand that. I just, I did it a different way, so I didn't know. Exactly. So, but this angle up here, this 10 is not going to, that's not going to be, that 10, there's no relationship between that small angle and that small angle. What about the angle that's on the other side of? 32? Yeah. This one, the 58? Yeah. That's 58, so, yeah. So then if I took 180, Minus yeah. So the, the only way we're going to be able to get to beta here is by knowing that, the alpha. So if we get that whole alpha, we can subtract off the 32 to get to the, let's get that one up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit of a puzzle. All right. Let's do a different application now. Let's do a simpler application now. Simpler application. The last application in this section is the, it's on page uh, 707, and it has to do with a, a ramp. And here's, what the, here's the scenario. So let's go through the logic of this. So the idea is that we're going to have a block on a ramp. And the block is going to want to slide down the ramp, right? Unless the ramp is made of Velcro. So the idea is that we imagine this block on the ramp, and the block weighs something. So it's going to want to slide down the ramp. You typically imagine this ideal scenario where the ramp is frictionless. We're not going to deal with coefficients of friction. So we're just imagining it on a frictionless ramp. It's just going to slide down. So what we need to do <coughs> is imagine the weight of this block. And we have to imagine the weight of the block having two components. It's going to have a component that is parallel to the ramp and a component that's perpendicular to the ramp. So it's going to want to slide down like that. And then I'm going to draw this perpendicular vector here. And our assumption is that we want equilibrium. If that block is in equilibrium, it's not moving. So what we're going to try to do is figure out how much force needs to be applied to the block to keep it from sliding. So we're going to imagine that ideal scenario. If we push too hard, the block's going to go up the ramp. If we don't push hard enough, the block's going to come down the ramp. 
So we're trying to figure out exactly that balance point. How much force needs to be applied to the block so that it stays stationary? And so with the block, in this static situation, there is a right triangle here. If we, create, if we draw that right triangle with the component that's parallel to the ramp and the component that's perpendicular to the ramp, if it's in static equilibrium, that triangle, that force triangle, will be in a right triangle. And again, if we push too much up on the block, it's not going to be a right triangle and the block's going to be moving up the ramp. If we don't push enough, the block's going to be sliding back down the ramp and it won't be a right triangle. Okay, so in static equil equilibrium, we have a right triangle there. And the, and the idea is that the force down the ramp is the force that's going to contribute to the sliding. The perpendicular force doesn't do anything for the sliding, for going down the ramp. That force is perpendicular to the ramp. There's nothing about that force that contributes to the sliding down the ramp at all. Okay? So it's only that force right there that contributes to the sliding. So we're going to, they call this a decomposition. We're going to decompose this weight vector into a component parallel to the ramp and a component perpendicular to the ramp. All right, so a typical scenario, we're going to be given an angle here. So let's suppose that the angle is 40 degrees. And then we're also given a weight for the block. Pretty standard thing. Let's say the block weighs 200 pounds. So then our question is, how, what is the magnitude of the force that we have to apply to keep the block from sliding, to keep it in equilibrium? So here's what we're going to notice. And the first thing we notice is that we have a right triangle, so that's good. We like right triangles. It's always <laughs> easy. So that 40 degrees, we have to think about some similar triangle type stuff here so that we can, so that we can get at this. Okay. So this angle is 40 degrees right there, which makes this angle how many degrees? 50 degrees. Does everybody see that that angle is 50 degrees? So the way that we see that it's 50 is that we're going to focus our attention on this right triangle. The weight vector is perpendicular, right? That's going straight to the center of the Earth. So that's perpendicular to the ground. So that means that that yellow triangle is a right triangle. And the two acute angles in a right triangle must add to 90. So that angle of inclination for the ramp, they call that the angle of inclination, if that's 40, then that angle between the vertical vector for weight and the ramp has got to be 50. Now let's focus on this triangle here, which is also a right triangle. If we focus on the force triangle, the force triangle is right there. That's also a right triangle. And if that angle is 50, what's this angle down here? 40. So we're gonna, you're going to get into the habit of not having to go through this analysis. And it's whatever the angle of inclination is for the ramp, that's the same as the angle down below the ramp in your force triangle. It's always going to be that way. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we know... If we pull out that force triangle right there, and let's pull it out with magnitudes. We don't need to think of them as vectors at this moment. Let's just think of them as lengths of vectors. So it looks sort of like that. And I just, I've got to make it look like a right triangle. OK, so what we have then is that this angle is the 40 degree angle. And this length is 200 pounds. And then our right angle is right there. All right. Well, that's enough to get the other two forces. The only force that we really care about is this one. This is the one that's parallel to the ramp. The one perpendicular to the ramp we're not going to use. When you get into physics classes, you use that one a lot because you study something called the coefficient of friction. And that force perpendicular to the ramp will um, you know, it will influence, uh, the coefficient, coefficient of friction will influence that force. So we won't look at that one, we're just looking at the parallel one. So we want to know that force right there. So 
let's just call that side P. That's the force parallel to the ramp. And we can use right triangle trig. That's cool. And the sine of 40 degrees will be the side opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So that's going to be the parallel force magnitude over 200. So P will be 200 sine 40. So somebody type that in and figure out how many pounds of force that is. 200 times sine of 40. Round it to the nearest unit. 129 pounds. All right, so that's the magnitude of the force that needs to be applied to the block to keep it from sliding. So if you push with a force of more than 129, it's going to go up the ramp. If you push with a force less than 129, it will slide down the ramp. So this is a pretty, this application in this section, it's a common application. We also do this application in other classes higher up. But it's a nice simple application because you are dealing with the right triangle. So it's a little easier than the navigation problems where you have to pull out the law of cosines. Right, so let's do another one. You guys try this one. So let's suppose that we have a ramp with an angle of inclination. Let's suppose our angle of inclination is 20 degrees this time. And we've got a block on our ramp. Let's just steal this block. Make it a little smaller. And that block's on the ramp. And let's suppose that that block weighs 900 pounds. So the question then is, if the block weighs 900 pounds, what force is necessary to keep the block from sliding? Right, so. See if you can draw your force triangle. Let's see if you can figure out your magnitude of the component parallel to the ramp. I'm going to couple blocks on the ramp. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine it's a motorcycle. You're pushing your motorcycle up a ramp to get it into a truck. Or your snowmobile. You've got to figure out, so when you're trying to figure out if you have the power to load your snowmobile into the back of your pickup truck, figure out what the angle of inclination needs to be for your ramp. <laughs> it has wheels and a motor. <laughs> Your broken down snowmobile. Okay. So the first thing that is is really helpful is to just sort of is the mechanics of it and understanding that we want to have a right triangle <coughs> for equilibrium. So sort of drawing this triangle in the correct way is it's going to be super helpful in getting the problem correct in the long run. And so and it also gives you some good insight into how forces work. So you want to draw bless you that force triangle so that you have a component parallel to the ramp and a component perpendicular to the ramp. And throughout, as you take other math classes, <coughs> get into calc, this is a super common type of thing where you take a vector and you decompose it according to some other vector. So the idea here is that we're, we're taking the blue vector and we're decomposing it with respect to this, this sort of axis right here. And that's a really common thing throughout math when you're starting lots of applications. You'll be looking at components of force in a particular direction, or you're trying to come up with a, 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 a formulation of a vector, and you've got to sort of weight it based on some, not necessarily the xy coordinate system, but something else. So we're decomposing the weight vector with respect to the ramp here.
is what we're doing. <coughs> and as you saw already, the quick and dirty answer is that, all right, that angle is going to match that angle if you drew this triangle properly. And the magnitude of the force up here, let's just call that P because it's parallel to the ramp. And we would say that the sine of 20 degrees is going to be equal to the magnitude of that force up there divided by the hypotenuse of the triangle. One common mistake is to draw your triangle with the right angle in the wrong place. So make sure that that right angle is between the two force vectors, the two, the, the two that are the, the parallel and perpendicular to the ramp. <clears throat> All right, so then P is 900 sine 20. And when we type that into our calculator and round to the nearest unit, what do we get? 308 pounds. So that is the force necessary to keep the block from sliding. Piece of cake? We want two of those on the test? Sorry, only one. Uh, only one. <laughs> only one. All right, so our test is a week from Thursday. And we have one more section that we're going to cover on Thursday. And so I want to start that section now and do the basics so that when you come in on Thursday, this week Thursday, we're ready to roll. There is a couple of application that, in, applications in that section that are a little complicated. Um, so Thursday is going to be, we want to, you know, Please read the section ahead of time because it, it really it will help. So let's do just some of the introductory stuff in uh, eight six. So so what we're going to do the first part of eight six is is pretty straightforward. It's very intuitive, <coughs> and it's the algebraic adding of vectors. So instead of geometrically adding, we're going to add vectors algebraically. And so it's done by adding corresponding components. The best way to do it is just to look at an example. So if we have, say, v equals 4, negative 5, and we have w equals 2, comma 10, the way we add these vectors is component by component. So the sum of these is that. Piece of cake. Add the x's, add the y's, add the first components, add the second components, however you want to conceptualize it in your mind, whether you're thinking of those as x's and y's or first components and second components. You just add the x's, add the y's. That is the result of vector. And we can look at a diet, we can look at a picture of this and convince ourselves that this is, is that this is reasonable. <coughs> um, we look at the vector 4, negative 5. Let's see, 4, negative 5 will be a little steeper down. So let's suppose that's 4, negative 5. So we're ending right there, <coughs> terminal point, 4, negative 5. And we look at the vector 2, 10. So 2, 10 is going to be up like that, way up there. 2 in the x direction, 10 in the y direction. So that's the vector 2, comma 10. And the resultant vector, the geometric way that we've been thinking about this is that we draw the parallelogram and whoops, and then draw the resultant. So it's going to be something like that. Más o menos. All right. So the resultant vector is right here. Get that. All right, seem pretty plausible. If we want to get all the way over to there, we've got to go an x direction, and then we have to go a y direction. And pretty obvious that the the red there, that the x direction, it's going to be that is four, and then we're going to add the two to get to the six. So if we add the two x's, that's going to get us the full x distance to the resultant vector. And if we add the y's, 
that's a 10, and that's a minus 5. We add those two together, we're going to be left with positive 5. So visually, you can see that, it's, that it makes sense. And as you do more examples of it, you'll start to see, oh, yeah, if I add the x's and add the y's, I get the diagonal vector there, the resultant vector. <clears throat> and the same is true with subtraction. So let's suppose we have v equals 5, negative 1, and we have w equals 2, positive 3. So if we have those two vectors, and the question says, find v minus w, well, we're just going to subtract, component by component. So v minus w will be 5 minus 2 and minus 1 minus 3. So the component form of that vector will be 3, negative 4. Negative four. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Okay. So the things that we've talked about so far, we've talked about adding, subtracting. The other thing we talked about was the magnitude of a vector. So let's take a look at a vector that's given in component form, and let's make sure we understand how to find the magnitude of it, and make sure that it makes sense to us, because it's. Important. So let's suppose that this is vector 4, comma 2. So I'll call it vector v. And if we want the length of vector v, which we represent with absolute value bars, how do you think we find the length of that vector? Should look really familiar, right? We've got the x, we've got the y, it's a right triangle, so the length of that vector is the same as the magnitude of a complex number. And so it's the same as the length of a hypotenuse of a right triangle, so we use the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to do the square root of the sum of the squares. Once again, we've done this a lot this semester. Square root sum of squares. So that would be simplified to 2 root 5. That's the magnitude of the Magnitude. Okay. All right, so let me give you an example to do a few things. So let's suppose V is minus 1, comma 3. Let's suppose W is uh, 2, comma 6. Here's what I want you to do. So find v plus and minus w. <clears throat> find the length of v. Find the length of w. And just do that. And then we'll talk about the we'll talk about a direction angle in a minute. There's one other thing called a direction angle. We'll talk about that in a minute. So find those three things. Or four things, I guess. There's four things. Anyway.
right, so B plus W, what did you get? One nine. So we add the corresponding components, we get one nine. How about subtraction? Minus three minus three. So we do negative one minus two, we do three minus six, subtract in order, and you get it. How about the length of V? So let's see. So make sure that if you're going to put minus one squared, you write the minus one with parentheses around it because that's the only way the two is an exponent touches the minus. So we're going to get nine plus one, which is ten, so root ten. That's the length of vector V. And then the length of W, same concept. We're going to do 2 squared plus 6 squared. So square root of 40. That can be simplified to 2 root 10. So 36 plus 4 is 40. 40 is 4 times 10. Square root of 4 is 2. <coughs> Next thing, we quite frequently in math applications need to scale a vector in such a way that we find a unit vector that's pointing in the same direction. <coughs> so let's suppose that this Vector v is 6, 2. Let's just suppose that. Maybe it doesn't look to scale. That's OK. 6, 2. That vector clearly is not of unit length. If we want to find the length of that vector, we will see that it's 2 root 10. We just did it. 36 plus 4, 2 root 10. OK. So now, if I look at this little red vector down here, u, I want u to be a unit vector in the direction of v. Direction of v. We know geometrically that if this, let's just suppose that was vector w. If that's vector w, we know that if we multiply it by a scalar, let's suppose I do that, that's about 3w. Right? <clears throat> Same thing is true if you multiply it by a fraction. If I wanted 1 half w, I would have the vector that points in the same direction, but it's half as long, so maybe there. So if you take a vector and you multiply it by a positive number, you don't change the direction. You just change the length. You're either going to compress it or stretch it. So knowing that, oh, we can scale that vector by multiplying it by a constant. The question becomes, well, what constant should I scale it by? How do I multiply that vector by a positive number that's going to shrink it in a way that it creates a unit vector, a vector of length 1, pointing in the same direction? <coughs> so I've got to multiply that by something. What do you think I multiply it by? It's the idea. We're going to multiply by a fraction, because that vector is longer than 1. So we need to scale it back. We need to compress it. So we definitely need to multiply it by a number less than 1. Not 1 6, though. Because if you do 1 6, then you'll have 1 comma 1 third. And if you do the square root of sum of the squares, you'll get 1 plus a 9. It's going to be more than 1. That's a great guess, So Another guess? u will equal something times 6 comma 2. Has to do with the length of the vector. Yeah. If you divide by the length of the vector, you'll get 1. You'll get the unit vector. And if you divide 5 by 5, you get 1. If you divide 6 by 6, you get 1. 
So that's going to be the idea. If we divide by the length of the vector, watch what happens. So for a vector, we distribute that across. So this would be 6 over 2 root 10, which would be 3 over root 10. I'm not going to, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to rationalize it. You could rationalize that if you wanted, of course. <clears throat> but this is the vector that we get when we distribute. So when we, multi when we scale a vector, each component is evenly, it is, is scaled uniformly. So that number jumps to the x, it jumps to the y, we end up with that vector. And how do we know for sure that that's a unit vector? Find the length of it, right? Square, square, add, square root. So we take the square root of the sum of the squares. What's 3 over root 10 squared? 9 tenths. 1 tenth. That's the square root of 10 tenths, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. So if you want to find a unit vector that points in the same direction as a given vector, divide by the length of that vector, and you'll end up with a unit vector pointing in the same direction. All right, we are primed to finish on Thursday, the last section of trig. If you need to bring tissues, go ahead and bring them, and we'll support each other as we finish up.